Anyways, those are my thoughts about the Snyder Cut. I hope it's not bad. I really don't. But I'm also not holding my breath. Well, I guess I can breathe. But only just a little bit. Ooh, that's a hot mug, guy. Hey, guys. This is my review for Zack Snyder's Justice League. The four-hour opus that has been given to us through a amazingly consistent and very very persuasive social media marketing which will definitely change the scales in terms of how film studios deal with reception to fan films or to films of cult following because the resounding roar for the actual version that was done for this film was not entirely unwarranted because holy god this is actually a far superior version not to say that this movie is a criterion collection but that movie was horrible it was terrible it was bare bones it was the blandest thing that i'd ever seen the humor and the complete tonal shift from what had already been established as well as what was kept in the movie from what snyder had done made no goddamn sense just cutting down your avengers moment into two hours was just asinine so to see this movie being four hours long yeah the length is a bit much but when you're going from man of steel batman v superman a prequel wonder woman to then your avengers movie definitely need a little bit more t of a padding in that film to kind of make up for what hadn't been established in the previous films and which had also been established very poorly in the previous film this movie does take a little bit too long i would say and if anything it's not so much the stories pacing it's the amount of slow-mo that snyder uses i swear that warner brothers told him that he couldn't use it for the first two movies when he got the full creative flow of what to do with whatever he wanted with this snyder's cut you can tell that he had just been having this big bag of slow-mo cocaine after the side and he just put it in front of him and then just smothered his face in it i would say there's about 30 minutes of additional footage or additional time in this film purely from all of the slow motion that's in this movie it gets very annoying about mm, uh, maybe an hour and a half in and funnily enough it correlates into probably one of the best parts of the movie which is the whole story behind cyborg being given a proper introduction and proper delivery his character was so bland and so undeserving of any sort of credit in the original film or the theatrical cut this version he's the heart and soul of the story i know a lot of other people are saying that but he is he is the core foundation of what is happening around them and he is the key but he has to not only find the strength and the courage within himself but he also has to forgive what has been happened to him, what has happened to him yeah sure there's some cliched story elements like his absentee father uh, just not being there and in the end things go awry and all this stuff and then there's this kind of sappy maybe kind of emotional makeup for it it's there it needed to be there but then going back to my slow-mo moment his entire football memory sequence is in all in slow motion it does not need to be that long and admittedly it does take away from some of the encouraging want to keep in to sit down and watch this movie in one sitting i couldn't do it i had to take a break at one point if you've been able to sit through this in one go good for you that's that's pretty uh, that's pretty good for you and where i took the break was in the middle of the film after the battle of strikers island which admittedly was done far better in this film because the villain of steppenwolf isn't a blandy mcblandy bland he actually has motivation. Sure, the armor can be a little bit odd, and I do like it better than the other one. I think that it's kind of just like that weird omni-metal kind of look that Cyborg has. Sometimes it looks great, sometimes it doesn't. It just whatever. But the fact that Steppenwolf actually has motivation not just to, you know, touch and lick the mother box, but he wants to go back home. He wants to be back in Darkseid's good graces. That motivation, you almost feel bad for him. You almost feel bad for a villain who's vanquish thousands of planets that relatability is something that you bloody goddamn well needed for this villain because he's not much else except for a big hulking brute with a big axe and weird ass horns having him have this constant back and forth dialogue with 
the sod, and then eventually dark side, it gives you some reason to be interested in what his motivations are. Villains need to be entertaining and you also need to, if not agree with what they're doing, at least understand why they are doing what they are doing. That is what this movie did. He's still not that entertaining, but at least you can't understand what he's doing. And that consistency is fluid throughout the whole film. You understand why everyone's doing what they're doing. Everyone may talk about Superman or Wonder Woman being the big heroes, but really it's the Flash in this movie who has probably the best sequence in this entire film during the climax. He does have the part where he saves his possible love interest from the car accident, which I don't know how physics worked, and that fact that that truck driver is reaching down for that <laughs> burger for so long. I really need to eat that burger. <laughs> Whatever, I'm gonna hit a granny, but I'm still gonna get that yummy juicy meat. That outfit was a bit odd, which oddly enough also kind of coincides with the soundtrack choice in this movie. There's a few parts in this film where licensed music appears, and it's so weird. It's not bad, it's not good, it's there. And funny enough, again, I can correlate this to the rendition of Hallelujah that they have during the credits of the film. It's a version I've never heard before, and it's about three times longer than any other version I've heard. But admittedly, while my wife and I were sitting there, we, we both stopped and looked up at the screen at one point in the song. And I feel that that is exactly how the film feels, because while the film's first hour is okay, it's nice, it's a nice rendition of kind of what we've seen before, the, the Amazonian battle is really well done, and kind of building up the allure of Darkseid through the mysticism and the history of his previous fight with Earth, rather than some stupid fight scene with a parademon and a goon which was done on the roof. I hated that opening. In this version, we have a very slow, but admittedly needing build up to what is happening. Then after the first hour, it starts to get a bit long and you start to get a little bit bored. And it's not anything to do with the dialogue or the story's pacing. I would say it's actually just kind of dull. You don't really have a good fight scene. Like the Striker Island one is still, it's okay, but I'll admit nothing in this movie, except for a part of the final climax, got my blood going like either of the two fight scenes in Batman v Superman with Batman fighting the goons or Batman Superman and Wonder Woman taking on Doomsday, movie's dumb, but that fight scene is still entertaining. This movie doesn't have any of that. It has all of its fight scenes in slow motion. Something I will give the 2017 version a bit of credit. I think that the Amazonian fight with Steppenwolf is better in the 2017 version maybe because there's not a lot of slow-mo. There's a lot of stake in that battle. Sure, in the Zack Snyder's version, we see a little bit more build-up towards it, but the pacing of it, it's really quick, it's really dynamic in the 2017 version, whereas in Snyder's, he was like, slow-mo, slow-mo, slow-mo. Maybe it's because I know how the fight scene plays out that it's not that interesting to me. Quickness and the loss on screen was so much more well played out in that version. That also correlates again back into the R rating of this film. It's not, it's 14A, which for you Americans is, I guess, a PG-13 still, but there's like a little bit of blood here and there. There's some scenes in the film that have a bit of like a decapitation or two, but if that's what warrants an R rating, and saying fuck twice in the movie, <laughs> then I don't know, I, I, I maybe, I guess. So kind of a recapping of how we've gone through the review so far. The first hour, it's slow, but it's good, it's necessary, it's foundation. Hour two, it's okay, it starts to get a little bit dragging. Hour three is when it's starting to build up towards the final climax at the end of the film. And we see just different versions of these characters. Batman isn't your dad in a terrible Batman outfit with terrible, terrible quips. We actually see a change in him from the dark and gritty and near on alcoholic version that was like hiding the bottle but still there in the Batman v Superman film. And this one he has a lot more uh, prosperity. He has a lot more hopefulness in him because of what he's doing. And the same for Superman. I felt that Superman's return in this film was a lot better. We take a lot more time with him remembering who he was and kind of realizing his purpose on the planet. And then the bit of him going through the ship and hearing his dad's voice, both of his dads. I love that little bit. It correlated with the score, which was done by Tom Holkenberg. I didn't even know that his music was entirely removed from the 2017 version. It was all Danny Elfman. And Holkenberg's music is good. 
In most cases. I feel though that every time the Amazons or particularly Wonder Woman appeared, he just had one track and he just kept hitting the repeat button. Because he kept on hearing that. Did you at least record a second version or maybe another song like this? Because like, I swear just repeat, repeat, repeat. While this movie does do a lot of things better than the 2017 version because it is the original version that we were given, it still has issues. It has pacing issues. It has cliches. For a film that's four hours long, it takes quite a bit for any kind of comic book action to happen. Essentially, it's its own version of Endgame because Endgame really only has one big battle sequence and that's at the end of the movie. Whereas this one has a few, but none of them are as entertaining as the one at the end of Endgame. But in the end, I will still say that this film is far better in terms of its tone, in terms of its cinematic uh, presence, in terms of its structure and what it was building. Like, there's actually decent and not completely obviously forced in foreshadowing towards future events in the in the DC universe. The idea of dark side is present. The whole kind of foreboding future of the, the dark side world and the mother box future and what Flash can do with his time element bending and then Cyborg kind of getting his own vision of what's going to happen. I like that. It was really subtle. And Snyder doesn't do subtle well. <laughs> but if I can talk about one thing that's a little bit spoilery, I will say that the final sequence at the end of the film, particularly in, it's with Flash, it's the best moment in the entire film. The, hands down, the best part because I went from laying back in the chair during the second sitting to full on sitting forward and going, oh shit, are they doing what I think they're doing? In terms of scope, I guess you would say it's not like, oh, but it's fun. And I think that's probably one of the most amazing things about this movie to me is that it follows the same general plot points that 2017 has because 2017 was based off of what Snyder had shot. But for a movie that follows the same general plot points, it feels like a completely different cinematic experience. It feels like something completely different. I appreciate that. I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting it to be kind of like, okay, I get the gist of it, maybe a little bit different here and there. We already have the sense of knowledge of what these characters are in their past and whatnot from the 2017 version. Instead of it kind of being like, eh, eh, throwaway shit, it's actually established. Sure, not the best in some circumstances, but it's still done for the purpose of building a story. And when you consider that the last time Snyder really involved himself in writing the story for a film was Sucker Punch, you gotta give the guy credit for being like, okay, you know, I'm not gonna do the best job, but I'm still gonna do an okay job. And I think that's probably what is the best part about this movie, is that it's okay. And sure, there's that weird little epilogue thing at the end, which goes on way too goddamn long in my opinion. Really, Snyder's version, while having flaws, is still a far superior version. I will give a credit at the end of the movie when they're all standing up on top and they're all just doing that slow-mo pass with the music playing. I imagine it's Zack Snyder giving the biggest fuck you to the Warner Brothers executives who thought that his version wasn't good. They thought that the version that Whedon made was better and he's just like, go fucking suck one, you cocksuckers. <laughs> so I've been talking for a while here, but I just really wanted to kind of express as much as I could because I don't know if I'll do a spoiler review. Some people have, I might do a talk about it. So in the end, I will give Zack Snyder's Justice League a four out of seven. I almost thought of five, but that length is just, ooh, it's just too long. It's just too long. Like, if you cut out a lot of the slow-mo, maybe three and a half. And I think you could have gotten away with that considering Endgame did it, essentially, sort of. But otherwise, though, that's all from me, guys. I hope you enjoyed this review. Sorry for it being so long, but I really, really wanted to talk about it. I would suggest see it. It's better than the version that we got. Anyone who is still defending the Whedon version, I don't know what's wrong with you because... Yeah, sure, it's got terrible jokes, but if you're a fan of that, whatever. But this one, thankfully, oh my god, the fact that the brunch joke is gone, the talk to fish joke is gone, the yep, something's definitely bleeding is gone. Oh, thank god, those are so bad. There was such terrible jokes. Otherwise, guys, that's all for me. I hope you enjoyed the review. See you guys next time. Thanks for watching the video. My name is Nitz, and you might remember me from the animated cult classic TV show, Undergrads. It's been a while, but I'm happy to say the click is finally getting back together in an all-new movie, thanks to a successful Kickstarter campaign. But we are still asking for your support. 
To see any and all updates about the upcoming Undergrads movie, be sure to check out and like the Bring Back Undergrads Facebook page. And with any luck, we'll see you guys soon.